right, well, turn in your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, why don't you uh, stand up for the reading of God's Word. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, as you turn there, just be reminded that this is God's Word, and every single word of it is divinely inspired. It is without error of any kind, and it is the only final authority for everything that we are supposed to believe and everything we're supposed to do in life. So be addressed by God as you hear these words from Hebrews 9, starting at verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, He entered once for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of His own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank You for the word of the cross, which may be folly to the world, to those who are perishing, but to we who have been called by Your grace, it is the wisdom and the power of God to save So we thank You for that good news, Lord, and we pray that You would make it clearer to us today, that we would find newer and newer angles and depths, not that Your gospel was ever lacking, but our hearts are weary and our our eyes and our ears are sometimes uh, clogged and not able to see, Lord. Would You please write this word upon our hearts by Your Spirit and make us Uh, Truly believers today, increase our faith and make us know the benefits and the love that we have because of what your Son has done. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this message is The Atonement of Christ. This is part three of a five-part series on the work of Christ. We've looked at the incarnation. uh, We've looked at the obedience of Christ, and now we're looking at the atonement of Christ. And there's a lot there in that passage uh, talking about God's intention, talking about the the finished work of Christ and its benefits for us. Um, There's no way to, you can't preach on the cross and just do anything but skim the surface. Uh, This is the heart and soul of the Christian faith. This is all of our hope right here. And so anytime you do a sermon on the cross and you limit yourself to uh, hopefully less than an hour, Um, you're talking about something that you're only really going to skim the surface. So I'm not much for reinventing the wheel. Uh, As many of you know, I'm reading a uh, pretty massive three-volume work of a 17th century theologian right now, and uh, about that much reading to do. And and at the very center of it is his uh, section on the work of Christ, uh, the atonement. And so I thought, well, I'll just ask the three questions that make up the heart of his section on on the work of Christ. And those three questions are basically this. Number one, was it necessary for Christ to make satisfaction to divine justice for us? Now, that's a lot of words right there. Think, well, the cross, I thought that was just sort of like the, the logo that we show people to get them into the church doors, to say that God loves you in some way or come follow Jesus in, in some way. Um, so we need to go deeper there. Um, What Christ does for us is something um, that theologians used to call satisfaction. In other words, satisfying the debt that we owed to God's justice. So that's the first question. Was that necessary? Secondly, did Christ in fact do it? Did He accomplish that? And then thirdly, was this satisfaction perfect so that there's nothing left for us to pay, nothing left for us to do? So those three questions are going to make up our three points today. Here it is. Here's our outline. Number one, the necessity of Christ satisfying divine justice. Secondly, the reality of Christ satisfying divine justice. And then thirdly, the perfection of Christ 
satisfying divine justice. So here's the big idea. This is the doctrine or the truth that we're going to see from all the Bible verses we're going to read today and everything we talk about. It is this. The cross of Christ has fully satisfied God's justice so that there is nothing left to pay. Let me say that in another way. A couple months ago, we did a, a series on the doctrines of grace, but I didn't just want to recycle my notes. I think that's cheesy personally. That's like plagiarizing your own work. It's stupid. I don't know why people, you know, I just, I can't do it. Um, so, I, and you know, you have to be in the scriptures. You have to be, you know, getting fresh stuff from it. But let me say it oh, the same way that I said it back then. And, and let this shock you. And it's true, and I'll defend it. And, and why anybody would want to believe anything else, I don't know. If Jesus Christ paid for your sins, you cannot go to hell. So there, there's this really, um, we're Calvinists. Um, that, that means we actually take seriously the doctrines of grace that made the Reformers leave the Roman Catholic Church. Um, don't let the statue behind me fool you. Uh, it's not ours. Um, we actually believe that Jesus Christ finished His work. And what we're going to see in this message today is that if Jesus Christ actually paid for every single one of your sins, well, there's no divine double jeopardy. God is not going to punish you. He's not going to mete out justice or payment or punishment for something that He's already punished on His beloved Son. Okay? So that's what we, we actually mean the gospel. We actually mean that God does it for you. And that's what our hope is in. And that is perfect hope. So let's start to get into it, the necessity of Christ satisfying divine justice. And if you're wondering about the big words and why would you even ask this, it's because a lot of people think that, well, couldn't God have saved some other way? Or when I believe in Jesus, I'm not going to bother about all this atonement theories and theological mumbo jumbo. I'm just going to believe in Jesus. I'm just going to, I found Jesus like he's Waldo or something, and he needs us to find him. You know, Forrest Gump was right about that, just so you know. Uh, sometimes the culture gets that right. That, that doesn't make any sense, you know. Um, God is the one who sought us out and found us and paid for us. So we're going to say, no, God actually could not have done this any other way, and that's actually important. When we speak of the death of Jesus being necessary, let's understand this the right way. We're not talking about the same kind of absolute necessity as if it's necessary to God Himself in eternity. Because the only things that are necessary for God in Himself is to be God. That God is holy, that God is infinite, that God is eternal, that God is God is the only thing that's necessary for God. God did not have to create the world to begin with. He did not need anything. He was not lonely. He wasn't bored. He didn't lack any love. He already had a perfect community of love within the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God needs nothing outside of Himself. And so it's not God we're talking about if we think that anything outside of God lays a claim on God. Nothing is absolutely necessary to God. But if God does make the world, and does save sinners, which he doesn't have to do that. God didn't have to make the world to begin with. He certainly didn't have to save us, having messed everything up. But if he has freely chosen to save us, God cannot save us in a way that violates his own nature. God cannot save us in a way where God is basically winking at our sin and saying, well, let's, let's just let bygones be bygones. Let's just Let's just forget, you know, you hear this all the time. God forgives sins. It's impossible. A holy God can never forgive a single sin. He forgives sinners of their sins. And there's a profound difference between those two things. God cannot forgive the record of sin by just sweeping it under the rug because then he would be saying to sinners, you're right, my glory is no big deal. The lives that I've given you, the image that you reflect, no big deal. You're right. Just trash it. I'm okay with that. That's not what we're talking about here. Justice has to be satisfied. So the necessity that Christ save in a certain way, the way that God saves us, the way Jesus died for us, the way Jesus came to earth, 
is exactly the way it is because of what it says about God. Something about God is being reflected in a way that could not have been any different. God's justice could not stand that a single sin go unpunished. And we see that throughout the Scriptures, that He's always saying that. He cannot deny Himself, 2 Timothy 2.13. God can only save sinners in a way that actually makes things right. By the way, that's what atonement means, right? The atonement. Some people even say, at one meant. That's one way to think about it. But if you just look at a basic dictionary definition of atonement, it means make things right. Well, that's what he has to do if he's really holy and just and good. Now, from a Reformed perspective, there are six different proofs or six different lines of argument you can use to show that this kind of an atonement, namely a satisfaction of divine justice, actually making things right, paying God what human beings owed God, was absolutely necessary. So last week we looked at Jesus Christ living the life that we should have lived, and God, through faith, counts His righteous life over to us as if we did it. That's the active obedience of Christ, and now what we're looking at this week is the passive obedience of Christ. If all God did was give us a righteous robe to wear that belongs to Jesus, we'd be sinning all over the place under that robe, and something has to be done about that, and that's the other half. Six reasons to see this from the Scriptures, that it, yes, it had to be paying God back for sin. First of all, the justice of God. That's number one. The justice of God in itself demands that justice be repaid. He says in the prophet, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. That means He's not going to overlook a single sin. That's not what the cross is. That's not Jesus coming to announce that God's going to be lenient now, not have a perfect standard. No, He must exact vengeance. This justice that we're talking about is not some impersonal searchlight called justice that's just sort of following us around, pre-programmed, on the hunt for human beings. This is the infinite personal God who sees every sin and can never relent from destroying it and upholding his honor. That same scripture in Nahum, I didn't read the rest, and there's other passages that say this, that his eyes are too pure to look upon sin. That doesn't mean he doesn't know about it. He knows about it, and it causes intense divine anger. Some will object to this, that God maybe should have been able to save without committing violence, without avenging himself. Well, that theologian that I'm reading, Turretin, he replies to that objection. It's not a new idea. He says this, For if it was free and indifferent to God, in other words, if God could do it any way He wants, to punish or not to punish sin without compromising His justice, so that no reason besides His mere will impelled God to send His Son into the world to die for us, what lawful reason can be devised to account for God's willing to subject His most beloved and holy Son to an accursed and most cruel death. In other words, if justice is not the reason, if hell is not what awaits sinners, if it's not that bad, if it's not that serious, if it's not owed to Him that seriously, then how do you explain God sending His Son not just to… Why couldn't Jesus have just taught us and lived on? Why couldn't He have just provided an example for us? Why would God put Him through that? unless God actually demanded that. Secondly, the nature of sin demands it. The Bible says that sin is lawlessness in 1 John 3, 4. It's a violation of God's law. Sin is the thing that is most opposed to God's glory. It's the thing that defiles God's property, which is everything. Every single square inch of our life, every thought, every feeling, every plan is God's property. And so the Bible uses the language of trespass for sin, that we're trespassing on God's property. Romans 4.25, Christ was delivered up for our trespasses. All sin lies about God. Think about it. It promises a happiness outside of God. That's why we do it. 
All sin deflects attention away from God's glory. And in doing that, it kills the souls of everybody around us and not just ourselves. All sin is therefore murder. Each sin, the slightest sin, leads your soul and the soul of anybody else who watches you say to them, God's not that big a deal. I'm going to go do this instead. I'm going to go do this with my vile language. I'm going to go live my life any way I want to. When people see that, you're commending to them hell. You are murdering their souls every time you sin the slightest private sin. Like a light covering itself in the darkness, it causes our souls to go dim and go out the rest of the way. All sin is selfishness and hatred of everyone we know. Thirdly, the sanction of the law requires that justice is satisfied. Paul speaks of a record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, Colossians 2.14. In other words, the law actually sets a legal demand. Every time we fail to pay it, which is every second of every day, that debt-o-meter, you think of that debt thing in New York City where the national debt is just skyrocketing that number, and that's, that's nothing compared to the sin and what's, what it's accruing before the justice of God. Legal demands, Paul says. Fourthly, the preaching of the gospel implies that justice has to be satisfied. And this starts with God's preaching in Romans 3, 24 and 25. God puts forward, God commends Jesus Christ as a propitiation. Now, that's a big word, but let me explain what that word means. Propitiation means wrath-bearing substitute or wrath-absorbing or wrath-quenching substitute. So, the word's used four times in the New Testament. And that's one of those places. It means that when God sent His Son, Paul is saying, He put Him forward as a wrath-bearing substitute. The whole reason, God's reason, He's telling you that I'm putting my Son in front of your face is as that which stands in your place so that my anger toward you will be satisfied that the payment that you owe me will come this way and be satisfied as my wrath goes this way that would have been held for you, and that is being satisfied. That's the whole reason, the central reason that I send my son to you, and he's doing so with his arms open wide in invitation and love. That's God preaching the gospel to us through the incarnation. Ephesians 2 also makes God our preacher of the gospel same reason. Ephesians 2, 17 and 14 says, He, namely Christ, came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. And he says in verse 14 that He Himself is our peace. So what does that mean? It means that God is sending His Son again, and now Christ, His Son, is preaching to us peace. And what He's saying is that He Himself is that way of peace. He makes peace. He ends the warfare, the anger that God had toward us rebel sinners. So God, God's form of preaching assumes that justice has to be satisfied. Fifthly, even the greatness of God's love shows this. And so the first reason that God devised this method of death for His Son, that punishment that showed us God's justice, that same extreme that God is willing to go shows us God's love. Since God did not spare His own Son, as Romans 8.32 says, not only is justice shown to be inflexible, but His love is willing to meet the demands of that justice. See, His justice could do no other. Every sin had to be punished. But God's love was willing to step in the way and meet the demands of His justice. Now, substitution for a guilty party was not an unfamiliar idea in the ancient world. Paul uses this theme in Romans 5, 7, and 8 when he's trying to show us how much God loves us. And he says, one might scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this is unheard of to substitute for another person, to die for them. But it does happen sometimes, Paul is saying, if it's a good man. Paul's saying, that's not us. 
God, who's perfectly good, is willing to die for people who are complete sinners. And sixthly and finally, the glory of all of God's attributes demands that justice is satisfied. The psalmist in Psalm 49, verses 7 through 9, he talks about a cost of the atonement. And when he does so, he talks about it in terms of worth. And he asks the question, Psalm 49, 7 through 9, Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on and never see the pit. So he presents a dilemma for us, and it's one that we cannot solve. The, the cost is too high. And you've got to ask yourself at that point, you've got only two choices for what he means by this costliness of ransoming our life. Either the ransom for man's life costs so much because we're so wonderful. Because the man who needs redemption, the sinner, is so valuable. And, and that's in a lot of Christian music even today. You know, a lot of people think this is nitpicky. There was a, um, a worship leader named Bob Coughlin, who, who criticized a contemporary Christian song uh, written by Michael W. Smith. And um, there, there's a one line in the song that says, uh, oh yeah, um, he thought of me above all in, in the chorus. And, and Coughlin said, no, that's not good theology. And, and people are like, oh, come on, you should be so nitpicky. Um, this is actually pretty important. And, and we want to communicate the right thing when we're talking about these things. The, the other option here is that the reason that the ransom of man's life costs so much is because the God who he has offended, the God in whose image man is, has trashed that image, has dishonored him when he is made to honor God. And so now man owes God such a price. The necessity of God having to satisfy His own demands on us is sometimes put in the language of desperate timing in the Bible. At the right time, Paul says in Romans 5, and that wasn't just for the thief on the cross, you know, that was the right time for him, but Paul's saying at the right time for all of us. And why is he saying that? What was so timely about Christ's satisfaction of justice on the cross? Well, the answer, according to Paul, was that it was wartime. In Romans 5, 6, he says that Christ died for the ungodly. I love how it says the chapter before, in chapter 4, verse 5, that he justifies the ungodly. Who does God slam the hammer down, the, the gavel, in his courtroom and say, not guilty, forgiven, innocent, you're in my family? Who does he say that for? Only ungodly, wicked people. You say today, oh, I'm a completely wicked person. Perfect. You're a perfect candidate for the grace of God. And he says here in chapter 5, Christ died for the ungodly. But here's what I'm getting at in verse 10. He goes on to say, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. It's like while we had the dagger, while we, we, we were throwing another spear at the target of His glory, while we were trashing and tearing apart His image and everything He gave us to talk about how wonderful He is, and we're just trashing it, while we're busy doing that faster and harder every single day, at that time, He dies for us. He lays down His life. Christ's work on the cross was so powerful and its beneficiaries, you and I, were so evil that the cross becomes a saving, healing dagger that violently interrupts our war against God and plunges us to our heart in order to plant the flag of God where He says, mine, that's mine, he's mine, she's mine, and, and everybody he's talking about is just this shaking worse than any toddler fit you ever saw, us trashing the image of God, and He's dying for us. This was not our idea. We were not seeking for God. The cross 
reconciles us to God while we were enemies. The sovereign grace of God is not just an election where he's choosing us before the foundation of time. In time, while we're making war against him, he's, he's launching out his son on the cross and, and taking us off the battlefield in love and transferring us into his kingdom at the right time. Well, that's why it's necessary. These next sections will be a, a little bit more brief, but it'll get to it really happening. The second point is the reality of Christ satisfying divine justice. We needed it, and He supplied it. Jesus performs this great work that in the Old Testament um, was sort of performed by a priest. And every world religion has some kind of a priest, somebody, some holy man, somebody that brings people into the presence of God or their supreme being or something like that. And so at first glance, it might look the same. But in the Old Testament, the priests of Israel were supposed to tell the story of what Jesus would do perfectly. And they didn't do it perfectly, but they were telling God's story. In Psalm 110, verse 4, God had foretold to Jesus, you are a priest forever. The Old Testament priest would do a lot of things to lead the people in worship, but at the heart of it was to assist the sinful people in offering their sacrifices to the Lord. And they couldn't do it perfectly. In fact, they couldn't do it well at all. As our great high priest, Jesus could do what no merely human priest could ever do. The book of Hebrews says this in a couple different ways, that every earthly priest had to bring a sacrifice of his own because he was a sinner. In fact, when you look in the temple and you see what the priest is doing, he's sprinkling blood on himself, he's sprinkling blood on the ground, he's so filthy, he, he made the dirt abominable to God. That's how sinful even the, the holy man was. And so these guys were telling the story of what Jesus would do perfectly. And so Hebrews continues in Hebrews 9.12 that Christ came not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And so the blood of Christ secures redemption. He really buys us back. God is paying the price to himself through his son. His son is the ransom and the price that is owed to God, he supplies for us. And that means he paid the price. He satisfied the debt by that blood. And interestingly, in doing this, he becomes the only perfect worshiper because the land that he bought was the only truly spotless lamb. You remember that in the Old Testament? They had to bring a spotless lamb, and sometimes they pulled it off. But actually, by God's standard, it was never spotless. Jesus is the only spotless lamb. He's called our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And so to say all this stuff, that Jesus was going to be the great high priest, the ultimate priest, that means that Jesus became our substitute. He took our place. Peter says, the righteous for the unrighteous. So on that battlefield, God targeted us. But now instead of his wrath, he targets us to put his son in our place, to step in the way of his anger and his justice. And so his justice goes together with his wrath. And so this awesome, dreadful thing that is aimed at sinners, in the Bible there's economic language that's used, and sometimes that can be, uh, you know, a lot of people complain about that. You know, God's paying God, and it, it's so dry, and it's an economic transaction. But the thing to see is that it's actually very, very personal. In Psalm 5 and Psalm 11, just to mention a couple places, it talks about God hating evildoers, that, that God's anger actually burns all day. He says his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. And you say, well, that was just the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, at the end of John 3, right, where all that stuff about God's love is, in John 3, 36, it was Jesus who said that whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God has been following him around. It's been living on him the whole time, apart from Christ. And so when we speak of justice being satisfied, 
We're not talking about something impersonal. This idea is absolutely inseparable from God's personal wrath being appeased, His anger being set aside or done away with. The act of God collecting His payment and the act of God spending His anger are actually one and the same action. There are two aspects of the same action. Think of it this way, that on the cross, God is this way satisfying His wrath. His anger is being poured out on a substitute and absorbed. And that propitiation, that thing Christ, the sacrifice, the substitute, that satisfies or absorbs all of God's anger, that action pays the price that was owed, the justice to a personal God. And so the fact that God was satisfied with the payment that Jesus gave is seen as an offering. In Ephesians 5, 2, for example, it's pictured as a religious sacrifice with, with incense, that kind of a thing. Uh, Christ is called a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so God was accepting the sacrifice of Christ and like a religious offering with incense was pleased at the aroma, that's the language, pleased with the worship offering. But it's also talked about in an economic sense. We've seen 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. So you were bought back with the blood of Christ. So the blood is the ransom price. The action is the redemption, God buying us back. And what was going on in time and space, and I don't mean to diminish the, the, the most excruciating form of torture, really, devised in the ancient world, the crucifixion and all, all the things that led up to it, the, the beating and the, and the whipping and so forth. I don't mean to diminish that one bit, but that actually all, all of it put together was really the surface of what God had poured out on our Savior. That's why Jesus was, you know, sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane and saying, would you please let this, if possible, let this cup pass. That cup, the imagery comes from the Old Testament, the cup of God's wrath that he's going to pour out on his enemies. Jesus is taking that cup for his people. Isaiah 53.10 says, It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. So not only is God the object of the atonement, that, that Christ's Sacrifice is not aimed primarily at human beings as an example of love, something that's going to affect our hearts, and it does that too by the power of the Spirit. But the primary target of the cross of Christ is God Himself. It is an offering to God, but the primary subject of the atonement, the one who is acting upon the cross, is also God Himself. He has put him to grief. Not that the Roman centurions put him to grief, though they did. Not that the Jews in the false court who slapped him and spit on his face put him to grief, though they did too. But that was only the surface. It was God who crushed the Son instead of us. Notice three times in the book of Hebrews, speaking about the old temple and the old sacrifices and all those things, he calls them copies of the heavenly things. Not simply that they were copies of the future thing, namely the cross, which is true too, but ultimately all of that was a copy of something that was affected in heaven. The cross affected your salvation in heaven forever. And that's why the book of Hebrews calls it an eternal redemption. When the book of the law talked about a hanged man being cursed by God in Deuteronomy, Paul picks up on that language in Galatians 3 and, and, and says, as it is written, because in Galatians 3.13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone 
who's hanged on a tree. So what happened there on that special tree in the middle of history? Was it simply what the Roman centurions inflicted on him? Was it simply the crucifixion? No, what happened there, 1 Peter 2.24 says, is that he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He became the, the whole curse of the covenant that we violated. What would have been hell in eternity for us, he bore all of the sins that we've committed. Or in the verse we looked at last week in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him sin. That doesn't mean that the divine nature became sin. What it means is that God considered, He imputed over to His Son. He reckoned over to His account all the evil things that we've done. So as we saw last week, all the good that Christ did comes to us. But all the evil things that we have done goes to Him. And the highest concentration, have you ever thought about this? What's the most abominable thing that God's ever had to look at? What is the most wicked thing, the most evil spot in the universe, the thing that is the biggest profanity to a holy God? You want to know why the lights went out for three hours during the cross? Because God the Father, just as the song says, uh, how deep the Father's love for us, looked away because He could not look. His eyes were too pure to see evil, and the most wicked thing that you'll ever see in this world was the cross of Christ. His own Son became a curse. His own son became an abomination. His own son substituted and took on what we deserve to be and to be the target that would have been hell for us to pay. He heaped it all on the Son of God and treated his son at that moment as if he was as wretched and God-displeasing as we are. Thirdly and finally, the perfection of Christ satisfying divine justice. The question remains and really depends on your theology and what you'll accept. If we're a typical Americans, we might say, well, I, does this really matter? Well, when you come to Christ, you'll keep sinning. The devil will keep having your ear. If you're truly saved, you'll have a sensitive conscience. You'll have the Holy Spirit in you convicting you of sin. Does it matter? When the New Testament speaks about the work of Christ on the cross, it does not speak about it as if it's simply our logo to get people into the church. And then how we follow Jesus or think of, well, I prefer to think of the cross as Jesus was the ultimate martyr. And it really inspires me to go get on the mission field and so on. Well, you're deluded. You're completely deluded. And I say that in love because you're going to need this. When the New Testament talks about it, it uses the language of perfection. It uses the language of completion, of a full and final atonement that grabs you off the battlefield and never lets you go, that actually pays for every single one of your future sins so that you never have to say to yourself, I wonder, well, what if I die tonight before I confess all of my sins or even remember them? You won't, and if you do, you'll be full of it. And God will be able to see through you. Your repentance will need repentance. And when you try to repent for that, R.C. Sproul called it moral hemophilia. The more you scratch, the more you bleed. And you'll become a righteous hypocrite, a Pharisee, because you'll try to do it on your own. But the Bible speaks about the cross as something that really accomplishes everything we need, something that was invincibly finished in Christ And often evangelicals will speak in the right way about this. We'll talk about the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that's right. But do we mean it? Do we really mean that it is the finished work of Christ? Jesus did. One of His last sayings on the cross in His dying breaths in John 19.30, it is finished. By the way, the Greek there Tetelestai is actually a perfect tense, which means something that happens and the effects of it continue indefinitely. And so it means it has been finished and it'll never stop. Some people say paid in full, and it doesn't literally mean that, but that's the sense of it. Paid in full, account settled. That's what Jesus means when he says, It is finished. What is finished? Divine satisfaction. 
satisfying the demands, the legal demands that were against us. So, whether you use the economic language of redemption and ransom, or whether you use the language about personal anger and appeasement of wrath, the words in the New Testament are always telling us, it is finished. Read the redemption passages. You were bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20, and then it gives you a bunch of implications. You want to get on with that. Okay, don't be a slave anymore and all that good stuff. Honor God in your body. Yeah, but you can't get on with the, with the practical implications of that if you don't believe the ground of it. He bought you. God doesn't bounce His checks. He didn't put you on layaway. He paid for every single sin. And we already saw 1 Peter 1.18 about that precious blood. And Paul says in Ephesians 1.7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Parallel passage to that same one in Colossians. Paul adds the words to that, and He has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. So, so every time the Bible talks about it, it talks about something as, that God has done. It's done. It's not like He's doing it at the front door and, okay, now the slate's clean, go! And then we try to do it again. No, you don't want that kind of a gospel. He, he's paid it all for the whole course of your life. And finally, in our Hebrews passage that we opened with, it says about the sacrifice that He secured for us an eternal redemption. The payment happened in eternity. It has an eternal quality, unchangeable, unshakable. So it's perfectly paid for. Other passages that show this prove it from the implications, the benefits like sanctification. That's a benefit that God is making us more like His Son every day. Well, listen to Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He has perfected them for all time, those who are being sanctified. What about the benefit of forgiveness and freedom? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I wish more Christians believed that for each other and for themselves. This has present implications. This is not simply that there will be no hell left to pay one day. There is no hell left to pay right now. And so if there's no hell left to pay then, which was God's property to pour out on you, then who are any of us to pour an ounce of hell? on any brother and sister and keep them down in their sins and not forgive them and not let them get back up, write them off as a lost cause or anything like that. This has powerful implications for our Christian life. One thing it also means is also implied by our Hebrews passage, Hebrews 9.14, how much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works? to serve the living God. That means all the things that God commands you to do now, which you will not do to His standard of perfection. Christ's blood constantly says before the Father, get back up, son or daughter, get back up. There's no penalty box. There's no purgatory. You don't have to wait 20 minutes or two weeks or after you do a certain amount of se seven Hail Marys or whatever. You don't have to say Hail Marys to your evangelical brothers and sisters. You get right back on the battlefield. Oh, I can't discipline my kids. I, I'm such a hypocrite. I lost my anger five minutes ago. You don't discipline your kids because of what it says about you. You do it because of what it says about God. God already knows you're a failure, but in Christ, you're completely free to obey Him right now and now and now and now. No timeouts. No letting anybody else tell you, well, you know, you, you can't tell your kids not to smoke pot. I mean, your head's still smoking like a chimney from the 60s, uh, something like that. You don't listen to that garbage. You say, get behind me, Satan. I mean, brother, I mean, it's called you Satan for a second, but, but you got you to gotta get used to saying that and get back up on your feet and actually live the gospel because of this kind of a cross. So total forgiveness, total purity of conscience, moment by moment, not just escaping hell, it's about being free to obey God right now, free to expect big things from God right now because of how big of a Savior He is, not because of how wonderful we just did. 
And so if Christ's blood, talking about 1 Peter 1.18, if Christ's blood is precious to God, if he says this is the best price conceivable, I love it, if Christ's blood is perfectly acceptable to God, why isn't it perfectly acceptable to you? Do you have a higher standard than God? Do you ever not forgive yourself? I do. Are you ever, you ever have a trouble doing that for other people? Then you must have a higher standard than God. God says that the blood of Christ is infinitely precious to him. And that actually sets us up perfectly for our application. Four things, four things in closing. What should this exact work of Christ do in our thoughts, in our minds? I had all sorts of application in mind for what should, this should do for our speech, but we have limited time. So just, just four things that this should make us change in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our meditation and, and thinking about the future. Um, how should this affect our thoughts? Well, first of all, the devil has been disarmed of his lies against you. You ever read Colossians 2, 14 and 15? There's a connection that Paul makes between God satisfying his justice on the cross and whooping up on the devil. And you know, what's the connection? Paul says in Colossians 2, 14 and 15, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And then the next breath, he's just like, oh, he changes the subject. He doesn't. He says, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Triumphing over all the demons in the cross. It's like when he took that record of debt that stood against you, when he nailed that to the cross, he nailed the devil's head to the cross. What's the connection? Revelation 12, 9, Zechariah 3, I'll get that verse later. There's a bunch of other places. You know what the devil's main job description is? He's the accuser of the brothers. He's the accuser. Now, he's our adversary, and he does a lot of things in temptation and lying and so forth. But the main thing the devil does, the main thing that makes you ineffective as a Christian, makes you doubt your salvation, makes you doubt the salvation of others, the main thing the devil has against you is your record of debt. Guess what? The record's true. You did sin and you deserve hell for that. But what Paul is saying here is that God took that and he nailed it to the cross. He took every single one of your sins, all of your future sins, all of your secret sins, all of your unintentional sins. Unintentional sins? Yeah, read Leviticus. Every single one of your sins. And he said, I'm going to pay this for you. The devil has nothing on you now. And if that's true, that will revolutionize your life if you believe it. So that's number one. Number two, God has given the greatest proof of his desire to bless you. Romans 8.32, Paul says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So you're worried about a healing, which he may not do. Read a couple of verses earlier. I did a sermon on that, Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for your good. He knows you're good, you don't. So you will not get prayers answered the way you want. But you can be sure that God is working it out for your good. So you're worried about certain goods. You're worried about your future. You're worried about, I am. I'm worried about, uh, I'm worried about my kids as a parent. I'm worried about my status because I'm full of myself. I'm, I'm worried about money. I'm worried about these things, and I bet you probably are too. You're worried about how others see you. What he's saying here is, if I was willing to give up the thing that is most precious in all the universe and subject him to this kind of a death, what do you think a little bit of money is? What do you think a little bit of some people? You want your church to grow? You really think that's a big thing for God? He may not do it for your good. But do you think it's hard for God? That's, it's a greater to lesser argument that he's making in Romans 8, 32. If God is not, if he was willing to give up his own son, think of everything else in the world that is good and put them all together. It's nothing. God is not stingy. And so by the cross, by satisfying his justice, he's saying everything else, nothing. Drop in the bucket. Easy. 
for God to do for you. Thirdly, God has opened wide his throne room for our prayers. After talking about Christ as our great high priest, that he comes into the presence of God with his own blood, not with the blood of animals and a bunch of other things that don't work, the very next words in Hebrews 4.16 is, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Fourthly and finally, God pleads with us as the most eager father to come back into his presence moment by moment. In the cross, in satisfying his justice, he is saying, come back. At every, you sinned a second ago, he's not unaware of that. He knew that before the foundation of the world. That doesn't cheapen it for you. That's not going to make you say, well, I guess it doesn't matter what I do. No, you're going to be crying out as a child of God and want assurance of your salvation. And he is saying by the cross, come back. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, what is that about? God, in order to be just, would have to forgive me? Not in yourselves, but because he has paid the debt in his son, he is now taking care of that for you. None of that, none of those promises make sense unless there was a full atonement. But all of them are true because he has redeemed us in Christ. He has nailed the entire record of debt that stood against us to the cross. He has fully forgiven us and clothed us with the righteousness of his Son. And this was the whole story from the beginning of the Bible. This is not a plan B. This is what God designed in making the world. The great wisdom of God in putting his son on center stage in this exact way is seen in the clear words spoken through the prophet Isaiah over 700 years before the event. And notice here that in the Isaiah 53 passage, you have all the elements of the atonement that we've looked at. And so this is great news that God has done this, that he planned this. Listen to the words of Isaiah again over seven centuries before it happened. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Lord, how great a salvation that we still have only scratched the surface of. We thank you for it. We thank you for your Son. We praise you for your justice, that it must punish sin. And we ask you to help us hate our sin more and more. But we also thank you that your love